things just kind of mixed together, right? So, um, you know, you can tell that maybe there's some kiwi in there, some banana in there, two different kind of areas, but it's all mixed together. Maybe you're going to uh, the grocery store at 10 a.m. on a work day, for example. So those are just some different ways to look at it. So what do you think um, for kind of good or, um, you know, as good as we can be work-life balance, what do you think that looks like? Finding enjoyment in both work and life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boundaries, meeting personal and professional goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of really good things here. So I think you've pretty much hit on a lot of what I have here. So life satisfaction and fulfillment, feeling like you have a handle on life, like you have agency, like life's not just happening to you. You have kind of some measure of control over things. Enough time for leisure and personal care. Good physical and mental health. And then experiencing joy and having fun. So what might some examples of imbalance be and how that might look in your life? Inability to sleep, burnout. Mm -hmm. from both your work and your personal life suffer, yes. Crying. Yeah, stress, physical health issues, big one. Hating work, always thinking about work. Yeah, stress is a big one for sure. And those physical symptoms. So here I have exhaustion or burnout, of course. Feeling angry, resentful, or maybe even hope hopeless. Limited time or energy for anything besides work. Poor physical and mental health, especially in regards to stress. And then maybe strained relationships. Um, if it's something like you're spending, you're having to spend a lot of time at work, maybe you're not able to nourish those relationships that you have in your life. So another question. Um, what have been your biggest challenges so far in maintaining work or school life balance? What's been the, what have been the biggest barriers for you? Learning how to say no. Mm -hmm. Wanting to do it all. Hey, Brooke, is it okay if we also, if anyone wanted to come off of mute and chat instead of just the text chat, are you okay with that? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. I had, I had one, which is just for me, I really struggle when I feel like I'm falling behind and I don't have a good balance or I'm in that imperfect balance of then like maybe saying the mean things to myself over and over again, like can't get out of, like, can't give myself the grace that I would give to other yeah. people. Um, so it feels mm -hmm. like very cyclical. Yeah, that self-criticism kind of comes out more. Yeah, for sure. A lot of things here, working with kids or when you have kids, yeah. Yeah, neglecting your your health or your own kind of self-care. Um, yeah, pushing yourself too much. The weight of commitments. Yeah, these are all really great ones. So as you can see, there's lots of different kind of barriers that could come up for people. 
Um, it could be more coming from you, coming from kind of how you're seeing things, how you're treating yourself, or it could be more external things. And that's something I'm also gonna focus on here of like, how is your environment contributing to whether you're able to feel balanced or not? So first thing I wanna talk about is just time. So this chart I have here, and keep in mind, this is very, very generalized, very simplified, but it's looking at full-time work and full-time school. So if you see there, the purple on the career side is 40 hours of work a week. And then sleeping, if you get, if you get eight hours of sleep a night, I know not everyone does, but there's that third, a third of the circle there sleeping. And the rest of the time you have for life about 42%. Of course, this is gonna vary if you maybe work more than 40 hours. Um, but then looking at the college side, and I hope this is validating for anyone who is or has struggled with school work, it's actually more than a full-time job. Um, that light blue wedge is if you take five classes a week, that's the time you're in class, but then that purple wedge, it's actually at least in California at SCSU or at the California State University system, um, it's expected that for every one hour that you're in class that you'll be studying two to three hours. Um, so that can be, you know, quite a bit of time that you're focused on school. And then if you're also working and going to school at the same time, it's even more, of course, cuts into that life wedge there even more. Yeah. So basically I'm showing you this to kind of get the point across that if, if you're having a hard time balancing, it makes sense just given time alone. So let's think about this even more. So we have like, 30 to 40% of our time devoted to life. But what does that actually mean? Is all these things, leisure, personal care, if we have family members to take care of, managing the household, gotta clean, gotta do dishes, um, community engagement, like getting involved in things in your community or different um, groups that you wanna be involved in, social connection, spending time with friends and family, um, travel time, just getting between all the things that you have to do, right? And, and of course, eating as well. So I'm sure there's even more than this. But again, just validating. You have to fit all this stuff into that tiny little wedge. I mean, it's no wonder that we all have such a hard time doing that. So when we're talking about these different kind of factors that go into um, our ability to balance, like what things impact it. We're talking about mindset. So some of some of you listed things like, or that self-criticism piece or like perfectionism, um, how much we're like trying to kind of push ahead or do more and more, those kind of how we think about work, how we think about, you know, school, et cetera. And then there's things like behavior, actions, choices. So that's more things like um, maybe things you do or don't do that impact your physical and mental health or your well-being, or maybe choices you make about how you do spend your free time. And these are more of like the individual factors. These are things that um, come from you that uh, you know you can control more or less, right? And I think in different kind of conversations around work-life balance, I think these things get focused on a lot um, for good reason. You know, it makes sense. It's the things that we have power over, right? Um, but I think what that kind of unintentionally does is make us feel like, you know, that it's completely our responsibility or completely our fault for it when we do feel unbalanced. And I think it's missing a big piece of the puzzle, which is these external factors. So when I'm thinking about external factors, I'm talking about a lot of different things. Your environment, where you work, where you go to school, what that's like, what the people around you are like, whether you have support, whether you have a support system, 
Um, even things like laws, labor laws could impact you, like things about minimum wage, things about time off. Um, social and cultural norms and expectations are another huge one. Um, just to give an example, a lot of fields, there is this kind of unspoken expectation that you have to kind of pay your dues in the beginning and you have to do kind of the hardest work or accept the least pay um, in the beginning until uh, you can kind of work your way up to have some level of comfort, right? So things like that, different norms around work. Um, another one is a lot of times people are guilted or feel guilty, made to feel guilty for taking time off. Um, it's not kind of, it's not really a priority in our society of what we value, like rest. So, um, you know, a lot of times because it's not really valued, it's like you take time off and you come back to even more work and it's kind of like, why did I even bother? <laughs> so definitely things like that affect it. Um, what's going on in the economy right now? Is there unemployment? Will that impact how willing you are to, um, maybe if you have a high workload, asking your boss for some leeway there that you might be more scared to do that if unemployment is a big issue. Um, you know, and then of course, the big giant collective, collectively stressful event we all have gone through lately, like that's a huge, huge impact on just our general stress levels, right? So um, I'm about to talk about now some kind of strategies based on these different areas. Um, and you know, with the external factors, of course, that's a lot that's not in our control, but I think there are some things, especially when things like our environment, like our work environment, that we do have some level of power over in kind of managing that or responding to that. So that's kind of what I'm gonna focus on with that area. So first of all, before we can get into strategies um, and know kind of how to fix things, we have to know where we're at right now. So I did that poll a little earlier and thank you all for participating in that. I was super interested in the, the answers that we got here. Um, it looks like actually the majority of people said four, um, that on a scale of one to five, with one being the worst and five being the best, that their current work-life balance is 19 people said four, 17 people said three, 11 people said two, and actually one person said five, which is awesome. And nobody said one, that's interesting, which is a good thing for sure. Um, so what I, ask, what I would ask you to consider is why did you pick the number that you picked? Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, I did realize it's probably because it's summer. That's probably a big factor involved in that. Um, but that's good to know. It's like that can impact how you feel. So why So why think about for you personally, um, why did you pick that number and why didn't you pick a different one? So if you did pick a two, why not one? If you picked a four, why not five? Um, what is it about kind of what your circumstances right now that maybe things could be better or things could be worse? And feel free to unmute and share or put it in the chat or just think about it. Um, I think for me personally, hi, I'm Mason McCool um, from the University of Alabama's chapter and I put a two because I know for sure, like I, I can definitely be so much better with my work life balance because I'm just doing so much, which goes back to, I mean, you know, not being able to say no and just wanting to do everything. Um, but I didn't put a one because I know that I'm not the worst. Like I have some, uh, work life balance skills, I believe. Um, but when I look at, you know, myself next to others and maybe some other my friends and other people I know I'm like I know that I am not where I should be with that so it's mm -hmm. so like I won't go all the way down to one but I'll go next to one yeah gotcha yeah for sure 
And it's so, yeah, so it's just so important to know kind of what is your, what for you, like, would one mean? And so you can be aware of like where you're at and when you're getting to more of that, wow, my work-life balance is getting towards one and really knowing that about yourself. I'm just gonna read these in the chat here. Having full control of your work schedule. Yeah, that's a big one. Mm. Toxic work environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of nuance there. And right, it depends on the time of year, the season you're in, what's going on in your life. It's really going to depend on that. So just important to know what your patterns are personally. So I'm gonna talk about first the, those external factors, those kind of environmental things or you know, uh, systemic things sometimes. So what I have here is make peace with what you can't control, take advantage of any flexibility or resources and know your rights, be assertive and set boundaries. So first things first, whenever we're talking about, you know, dealing with external factors, I think it's always important to think about how much control we actually have in a situation. I think we tend to kind of get caught up maybe worrying about things that really we can't actually impact as individuals that much. So um, this chart I have here is think about anything kind of that you're worried about and you could put this here. So I'm going to give the example of like you have too high of a workload. So first of all, thinking, can I change the situation myself? And myself being the key word here is can, do you have the full like ability to change the situation? If you do, awesome. That's where you can direct your time and your energy. If you don't, can you influence the situation? Can you, you know, chip away at it somehow? Or if you work with other people, can you make that happen? So um, with workload, you probably can't change it yourself necessarily. If you have a boss who's kind of setting that for you, um, maybe it's not fully up to you, right? Um, so, but maybe you can influence the situation um, by going and talking to them, you know, laying out where you're at, how much work you have and asking for um, some change to that. So it's all about just um, being realistic about what you personally can do and contributing what you can, doing what you can. And if you can't change it and you can't influence it, it's about accepting or letting go. And by accepting, I definitely don't mean that you have to be like, you know what, it's great now, it's fine. What I mean is you can still acknowledge that, oh, this situation sucks, but I'm not going to let it take over my emotions. I'm not going to let myself kind of get in that spiral of worrying about this. Um, so really like directing your energy on those things that you do have agency over. So take advantage of any flexibility or resources. Um, I think that, again, there is that kind of cultural um, norm or expectation a lot of times that we shouldn't take time off, um, that, and it makes us feel guilty all the times, I think. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for that. So I think it's really important to kind of counter that, to fight back against that a little bit. It is your time, you know? And so I think that it should be taken. You should use it to, you know, renew your energy. Um, so that that means using the PTO, the paid time off if you have it, um, taking your breaks, definitely. Um, you know, don't eat lunch like working a working lunch basically while you're working through lunch. Like really use that time for yourself and consider it an actual break. Um, if you've ever heard that expression, take a break or your body will take a break for you because it can't um, you know, handle it anymore, it's important that we do that. 
Um, it is your time. And I heard uh, kind of a, it's kind of like a, an analogy for this that I really like. Um, I was listening to a talk about hiking in the desert and how to stay safe when you're hiking in the desert. And they talk about like, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're hiking and you're kind of far from your car and you're starting to get overheated, that you should drink your water. You shouldn't try to save your water um, and kind of like conserve it because it's really no good to you um, when it's in the water bottle and not in your body. So I think it's the same kind of thing where, um, you know, your breaks are not doing you any good if you're not using them when you need them, your time off. Uh, I think a lot of people like to kind of save the time off so they can do one big thing, which I totally understand. But if you're like having like a hard time, you just need a mental health break. I, I just, you know, just take it, take it when you need it. I think that's really important for us to do. Okay, knowing your rights, being assertive and setting boundaries. I think this is a big one at work. Um, I think it's really important to know what your rights are legally and also just kind of as a human um, to not be mistreated. Um, you know, like, I think there's lots of things that you deserve from your workplace. You deserve to be able to stay home if you're sick, you know, to not worry that you're gonna be retaliated against for speaking up about something, um, to work reasonable hours, to have a reasonable workload, like all those things I think is something we should all have. Um, I encourage you to like get familiar with uh, wherever you work their policy manual. Um, look at anything related to you as a worker, like your time off, your compensation, things like that. Um, and also be familiar maybe with federal and state labor laws too. Um, you know, uh, like for example, if you work more than 40 hours a week and you're hourly, um, it is federal law that you need to be paid overtime if you work more than that. And so um, when I'm talking about this next part of this, like being assertive and setting boundaries, an example of that might be maybe you, you clock out and they're like, can you just do this one thing really quick? You know, it's about knowing that, you know, actually that's, I should be paid overtime for that. So I should clock back in. And so when we're talking about assertiveness, that's a communication thing. So it's recognizing that my needs and your needs both matter. So my needs and my employer's needs both matter in some regard. So like for the example of, um, you know, they ask you to stay over time, it's recognizing like, or coming at it like, yeah, I, I can see how you really need some extra help right now. Uh, I, I can help, but I need to clock back in first. Like being clear about that and setting that boundary. Um, you know, so... I think work is like a relationship and it should be a healthy one. It should involve mutual respect. Um, and so. Brooke, mm -hmm. I just want to bring up, Kirsten had a good point in the chat that um, hybrid work, work from home has made it harder for people to take their sick days mm -hmm. because I can work remote even though I feel sick. And while that isn't necessarily good and it will help you get better, it's hard. Yes, that is a really good point. Yeah, that kind of hybrid work is kind of blurring those things. I would also say there's a big trend lately with having unlimited PTO, and it seems like it'd be a good thing. And it's the same kind of thing. It's like, um, yeah, you're discouraged from actually taking it. Like there's not the follow through of like modeling that it's okay to take it. So yeah, there's a lot of issues around that. Um, so this little kind of scroll I have at the bottom here is, um, you know, sometimes it's not you. Like sometimes you do everything you can to kind of um, facilitate that work-life balance in terms of your work environment. Um, and you, it's only goes as far as your workplace is willing to meet you. And so I really just want to make it clear that if you have to leave a workplace because they're not working with you, you are not a failure. If you have to step back from anything, um, you know, any activity to preserve your health and men mental health, you, you are not a failure. I just want to make that clear. So 
so those were some of my external things. I feel like there's a lot more, but you know, within the scope of this presentation, those were some of the things I thought were most important. Um, and now I'm going to get more into kind of like individual um, things. So first one being behavior, actions, and choices. So um, build up your coping muscles, look at how you currently spend your time, and focus on the basics. So these are just some um, examples of things you can do when you're overwhelmed. So if you are like having a hard time in the moment, um, I think there was a question asked before this about how do you kind of um, break out of that overwhelming like to-do list kind of panic about like, God, I have so many things on my plate. I have so many things to do. You're kind of like spiraling about it. Um, these are just a few examples of things that you can do in the moment when you're feeling stressed. So first one is stop and do the opposite. So sometimes when you're in a spiral, you just need to stop. Like even if you have to like imagine a stop sign in your head, just stop, take a second um, and then do the opposite. So what I mean by that is if you're overthinking, do something physical or something that engages your senses. Um, so a lot of times things like grounding. So um, a common one is uh, like looking around the room and noticing five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can smell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's one way to do that. Another thing is um, if it's more like you're, you're feeling the stress in your body, it's trying, basically you're in that fight or flight mode, right? Fight, flight, freeze mode when you're feeling stressed like that. Um, and so it's trying to engage the prefrontal cortex, which is the rational, logical part of your brain. That part needs to come back online. It's kind of uh, in the background because you're in your like um, more like primitive response. So one way to do that, this is like a basic tenet of mindfulness is actually this next picture I have, which is kind of pulling back the curtain. That's from Wizard of Oz, like looking at the curtain of the great Oz and seeing that it was just the regular man. Um, so basically like um, you do that by recognizing what you're doing right now. So, um, and you say it out loud to yourself. So you, you would be like, I noticed that I'm having uh, an emotional spiral right now, or I noticed that I'm really overthinking this or I notice that I'm feeling stressed and not having judgment about it, but just noticing it can be enough to kind of get your rational, logical brain back on board so that you can kind of uh, move on from it instead of getting stuck in that. Another thing um, is I think always having your kind of your coping tools ready, especially you know when we're all so busy, finding those things that you could do in one minute and five minutes or 15. Um, and, uh, you know, writing those down for yourself so that you can call, draw on them later and being very specific about it too. So if it's like, there's a certain three minute, like YouTube video that always makes you laugh, like write, writing that down of like, that's something that I can do to kind of distract myself to be able to get out of that stress or overwhelm. Um, or maybe like texting a friend, any of those kind of things, like, um, you know, taking a walk around the block, deep breathing, whatever works for you personally. Um, uh, feel free, like, feel free to share in the chat, like what, what kind of are your quick go-tos? If you can think of anything that is good for just like when you have one minute or five minutes, what's something that you feel like helps you? Stretching, yeah. Go to song, good one, yeah. Breathing, a walk. Classical music, yeah. Yeah, pets. Yeah, getting in nature, going outside. Those are all really good things. And I feel like when we're in the moment of feeling stressed, sometimes we just totally forget about, oh yeah, I could go do that right now. So it can be good to have it prepared and write it down when you're feeling good. Um, to be able to use it later, right? 
So another thing is looking at how you currently spend your time. So I'm not focusing too much on time management in this presentation because I feel like um, I, I'm more focused on kind of how do you promote balance rather than how do I do more and more and more and more and more, uh, you know, like, but this is one thing that I think can be helpful for folks. It's called the Covey Time Management Matrix. And it's just a way to kind of categorize what you do, like almost take like a time audit of what you do during the day. Um, so basically the point is that um, you make a list of everything you do in a typical day, and then you kind of categorize it. So this first one is important and urgent. So that's things like doctor's appointments or like if you have a big test you have to study for. Um, and then there's important but not urgent. These are things that are, you know, just good for your well-being in general. Um, so things like exercising, et cetera. Urgent but not important are usually things that other people want you to do and they think is urgent, but maybe it's not something you need to be worried about right now or different like notifications that feel like there's an urgency, but you don't actually need to um, respond right away. And then not important or not urgent. So things like scrolling through your phone. And I think, you know, sometimes you need time to just like chill and zone out. But I think it's important to realize, is that something that's benefiting you? That's making you feel kind of refreshed or relieving your stress? Or is it just something that's not really doing anything for you at all? So that's one way to, to do that. I think it's really important to focus on the basics. Um, sometimes it seems really obvious to talk about this, like sleeping, eating, moving, going outside, social connection, all those like basic things that we need. I think we all know we need to do them too, but it's important that we be intentional about them. You know, we, there's, as we saw, there's just not enough time, but these are the things that I would say you need to carve out time for, because this is the foundation of well-being. If you don't have these things, um, you know, it's like you don't have the source of energy you need to do everything else. Um, I also think, you know, sometimes we try to find time somewhere and sometimes we take away from those things, like we take away from sleep you know, just stay up and get more done. Um, but that's really just stealing from yourself, uh, stealing from your energy and your, um, your well-being in general. Okay, my final set of strategies here are identify and address unhelpful thinking, define your priorities, um, values, and purpose. So I think a lot of you brought up some of these things. I think perfectionism uh, is a big one. Um, feeling like we need to do everything and do everything well. Um, you know, if, if it's not perfect, it's not worth doing. Um, and so I ask you to just kind of don't should on yourself yet. That's a good one. Um, so I ask you to just do this kind of like thought exercise. Like what would it be like to just have your work be good enough. Like not, not the best you can give, maybe like 80%. I feel like for me, that's really uncomfortable because I am somebody who I, it's just kind of a value of mine to work hard and put at my all into things. And I, I'm gonna assume that a lot of you are like that too. Um, and so it's really weird to think about like, what I, I can't just not do my best, but I think, you know, maybe it's, um, maybe you've done it before where you've like kind of come up with like a first draft of something, but then went back and kept working on it and kept working on it. What would it be like to like just turn in that first draft? I think it's important to recognize that um, that doesn't, you know, it might make us uncomfortable. It might kind of go against the value, but it doesn't change anything about our worth as people. Um, you know, we're still who we are. We're still loved by the people in our lives. Like that doesn't, it doesn't change anything about your worth as a person. Um, you know, things like, I think it's some, for some of us, it's really hard to ask for help, um, but we can't do all of this alone. You know, I think anybody who does, I mean, sometimes I feel like people who have the best 
work-life balance have a lot of help or like a lot of resources. And so it's important that we, you know, lean on others when we need it. And then of course, kind of addressing that self-criticism and uh, trying to, you know, kind of turn that into self-compassion. Like we're only human. We're do all doing the best that we can. Um, looking at some of these things in the chat here. Yeah, progress over perfection is a great one. Um, it is hard to accept less for sure. Um, but I feel like, you know, what's, what's the point of perfectionism if it's just harming you in the long run, you know? So just some things to think about. Um, I think this is a really, really important thing here. Um, defining your priorities, your values, and your purpose. I think going back to what I was talking about with the external, like, cultural expectations and norms about, I mean, it's things like, what does success look like? What is it? Um, what are we supposed to be doing? Like, our timeline in life, like, we're supposed to do this by our 20s, this by our 30s, et cetera. Like, there's all these expectations of what we're supposed to do. And I would really encourage you to look at all the things you're doing right now in terms of just thinking about why. Why are you, why are you doing what you're doing? Is it because you're doing it because you actually want to and it's something that will benefit you, that aligns with what you want out of life, that aligns with your values? Or is it something that maybe somebody else is expecting you to do? Or that's just kind of like maybe you grew up thinking like that was what you were supposed to do. Um, like really kind of follow that, that why question of like going deeper and deeper with the why about like, um, you know, why am I working so hard on this thing? Well, because I want recognition. Why do I want recognition? Because I want to be, I don't know, want to be loved, something like that, you know, kind of following that train of thought a little bit and really kind of thinking about too, at the end of your life, like looking back, what do you think you'll be glad that you prioritize? What do you think you personally, what do you think is a life well lived? And really using that to guide the time that you do have control over because, you know, we all, all have to work and all that. But in the time, you know, that you have control over, using that to guide what, like, where you spend your energy and your focus. Um, you know, thinking about what do I really value and care about? And am I living in alignment with that? And if not, what are some small steps you can take to get closer to that? Yeah, the material stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, those were the strategies I have. And I have a final note, which we kind of talked about is that like, if you're feeling imbalanced right now, those, kind, I feel like those periods just kind of ebb and flow depending on what's going on. A lot of times times have changed, like graduation, starting a career, having a family, all those kind of things can really change where you're at. And there may be times where you have more of a sense of like stability and that let, gives you more time to kind of focus on those things you need to like take care of yourself. Um, but those periods of imbalance usually don't last forever. So um, that's all I have for you. And anybody have any questions? Oh yeah, that's our um, that's our therapy dog at SCSU, Luna. Did you say her name was Luna? Yeah, that's my one of my dog's names also. Oh cute. Oh yeah, she's the most popular member of our team in the counseling center for sure. Hi Brooke, it's Gail. I just wanted to bring up a comment about how um, sometimes work for pay has better boundaries than volunteerism. Mm. Um, I just got, I'm on a, a volunteer board and just got something from someone who said they have an urgent need that I have to answer them right away. It's nine o'clock on a Friday night. Yeah. And the, just the porous nature of the boundaries in our society now are just mm -hmm. crazy. 
I love that. And I definitely have seen that myself. I think it's like when it's something like um, there's a mission involved, it's supposed to be like, well, if you care enough, you'll do all this, you know? So yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Brooke, to that point too, I feel like sometimes I'm I'm constantly checking myself as a leader, because I know that I can have influence on the perception and experience of other people. And so, you know, I have a new person who started my team this week, and I've tried to say several times to her already, if I'm sending you an email after hours, sometimes it's because I'm following up on work, but I don't expect that you are, you know, answering, but I still have to catch myself and watch myself that I'm not doing it too much. And that I'm living up to that expectation that I'm actually saying out loud because I feel like it can be a really slippery slope and I'm coming out of a really busy season where I was working crazy hours and people were responding at crazy hours. And I just know it sets a tone, an environment that isn't what I want. So I think especially also all of us are leaders with other people, like how we show up influences the perception of an organization for those other people and such a big responsibility. So I think this is really well time for me too. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's such an important point that um, leaders definitely have so much impact about how um, the people that are under them, you know, engage. Like you do have to model what you want them to do. You can't just say it. It's it's really about proving like, yes, this is okay to do this. This is what I want you to do, what I expect you to do. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. When I think the modeling can be really hard and I can point to a few people on this call that I know are often really good at trying to remind people to take time and take self-care, but they too are always really busy. And so I think it's part of the, again, the challenge of, you know, a lot of mortar board leaders are overachievers and they have been for a really long time. So it's a hard habit to break. Um, yeah, so I, absolutely. Feeling a little called out right now. Katie, are you, are you feeling a little called out right now? I will say I I'm with Katie, right? Like I am, I am very much a, I just had a thought, let me go ahead and shoot that off. And I find that I do that to Kirsten and then she'll, and she'll reply at nine 30 at night. And I'm like, stop. I did not mean for you to reply to that. I just had a thought. It didn't, it just, you don't, my brain does not require you to respond. <laughs> right you know to Gail's point of oftentimes in volunteering the boundaries are a little softer right so yeah, yeah. but I yeah. also employees and to Katie's point again you know I have very clearly told them after you leave it really is about I have email on my phone and I've had a thought and I start those emails with, if you are reading this after hours, close this email. And talk <laughs> I start the email with that, right? Because I need them to know I literally just had a thought and I will forget it by tomorrow. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah. It's, well, I think it's, it's, it's a give and take. It's both ways, right? It's about you kind of giving that permission, but people also, I think should set their own boundaries as well. Um, like I, I have definitely have a boundary where I won't check my email over the weekend, but I mean, that obviously depends on the nature of your work, but there's no emergency someone needs me for that can't be taken care of on Monday. So, right. <laughs> there, listen, there is nothing that I do. Even when I worked in nuclear, there was nothing mm. that I did in HR that could not wait until the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But I got phone calls at 3 a.m. Sure. regularly. Mm -hmm. Our students have a fun collegiate activity to go to at nine o'clock. So, and that's a great way to do some work balance, work life. Yes, balance. definitely. All right. Well, I'll let you all go then. Thank you so much for being here, for engaging in these conversations with me. I think it's so important. I well, appreciate you all. Thank you, Brooke. I don't know if you saw in the chat. This is a topic we want to continue with our students all year. It was, as Gail said, it was a fabulous session. I'm so glad our students and even our leaders and staff could hear from you as well. I think we are all taking away so many nuggets from it. So thank you for taking time out of your um, Friday evening to do a little bit of work with us. So 
you know, recognize that it is your weekend. So thank you for that as well. And, and we're probably not giving you the opportunity to model self-care as much either. But especially, as I said, we know that mental health challenges are arise on our college campuses. They're overworked, internships, jobs, school, trying to make money, you know, yet alone political, social, other challenges that are happening around them. And so um, we know that our mortar board leaders are facing this on a daily basis. And so I'm just grateful for you to be here tonight. And with that, as Gail mentioned, we want the students to go now have some fun. So you will go back to the main Zoom room link. So that's that unique link that we've been in all day. If you can't find it, check your email for mortar board national conference, Zoom registration confirmation. Um, and it should be there if you didn't save it. Worst case scenario, just re-register and hit join now, and you'll be able to get back in. So for the students, I hope you have a great evening having a little bit of fun. Um, and for everyone else, this is the end of day one. So thanks for a great day. Katie, I don't want to step on your toes if you have any closing comments, but otherwise I know we'll see people tomorrow. And Gail is starting us off with some self-care with yoga at 10 a.m. Eastern time.